Most Israelis agree with that. They say, yes, in principle, of course, the Palestinians have a right to self-determination, mm -hmm. and there's something deeply wrong about us ruling over them. Yeah. But those who oppose moving out of the West Bank, many of them would say, this is the lesser evil. Staying there is the lesser evil. Mm. Because of the terrorism and the proven record of the Palestinians, well, you can't say the Palestinians, but significant portions of the Palestinian uh, explicitly seeking not only to be free of Israeli military occupation, but to have the state of Israel removed. Mm. Pushed into the sea, don't they say? Right, things like that. Yeah. Now, th that's the official position of Hamas to this day. The right. Palestinian Authority has, in the Oslo Accords, recognized the right of Israel to exist. Mm -hmm. So the two-state solution is accepted by them. But a lot of Israelis mistrust that. So it's really Israelis who are want to con who choose or support continuing the occupation are, for the most part, looking at that not as an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. And they're not denying the evil of that. But they're thinking that moving out would be the greater evil because we can't let these people just f be without our control near our borders because it's so close and they're so dangerous and so committed to destroying us. So that comes back to the question of self-determination, people in the West Bank um, wanting self-determination. I guess then the, the ethical question maybe would be, and perhaps I'm, I'm the wrong person to use that phrase because you are the ethicist, is... Even if they're, I could say, even if they're complete dicks and want to commit harm to Israel, does that therefore mean it's ethical to stay there and basically keep them imprisoned or certainly keep them ruled over as a what some would say invading force? Well, you know, some Israelis are perhaps even just uh, racists or chauvinists, and they don't care about that. But I think there's a fair size of people who support the occupation. I'm not one of them. Mm but say this is just the lesser of two evils. Right. That is, yes, we, it's wrong of us to just hold them as kind of prisoners, mm. So, but we have no choice because we tried, uh, well, we moved out of Gaza, yeah. and then Hamas took control, and they're shooting rockets at us, mm. at our terrorist rockets, mm. at, at, at kindergartens and s civilian targets. So we just can't afford to abolish our control and we realize that it's a bad thing, and we just have to continue this bad thing indefinitely until something better turns up. So I, I think that's wrong-headed. Yeah, so you're saying you're someone who doesn't want to stay in occupied West Bank. So what, from your perspective, what would the solution be? Because if, if what you're saying is it seems you can't just move out and just go, okay, it's yours now, what is the solution to giving self-determination to those in the West Bank? Well, I should say I'm no political military expert, so sure. I'm talking about the ethics of this. Yep. To my mind, it makes no sense to say we'll just continue something which is immoral indefinitely because we can't see a way out. And it's unsustainable, you have to look, isn't it? Well, I think it's unsustainable. Yeah. Some people say, well, that's the best we can do, and let's hope it is sustainable. Yeah. But uh, in the long run, I would say that means you have to be committed to looking for some alternative, and that's what the Oslo Accord was about. Mm -hmm was trying to build up the Palestinian authorities so they can um, be a uh, partner with Israel in maintaining mutual security. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still think that can work, but uh, there has to be... Look, I'll just say this, making a more general point, okay. which I think <laughs> is an ethical point. There have been... I haven't seen this in the recent year or two, but for many years, it may be still the case, but for many years, if you did surveys on both sides, you found two-thirds support for the two-state solution on both sides. Right. Among There's a, a clear majority of Israelis, a clear majority of Palestinians were for the two-state solution. They can say, well, why isn't it happening? Yeah. Well, the cynical answer is we have leaders on both sides who have gained power from the conflict. So they're not letting it happen despite the will of the people. That's the cynical answer. And there may be some truth in that. But mm. I think the deeper and more humanly important answer is there's too much fear. From both sides. That is, it's easy for people to say, um, well, it's easier for people to say, yes, I think we should have a two-state solution. But yeah. then they'll go on to say, in order to make that happen, I need to be able to trust the other people and I'm afraid. And each side has legitimate grounds 
to be afraid of the other side? Mm -hmm. And how do you help people work their way out of that box Mm -hmm. from being afraid into where they want to move and in the direction which they believe is the right direction? That's a difficult challenge. We had the same problem in Northern Ireland. Well, that's my background. My, my, I'm, I'm Irish Catholic. I literally have second cousins who were in the IRA. So I can, when you talk about these things, I'm kind of thinking, yeah, well, uh, that wasn't a solution for Northern Ireland. And now with the whole Brexit thing happening, that's given them another whole headache about what Northern Ireland is compared to you know, the rest of Ireland. And so I, I can't say I understand. I am a- ignorant and naive to it. But I've grown up with an Irish mum who, you know, we had IRA, pa- IRA papers in our house, like newspapers. So so it feels that there is a similarity, at least there, to maybe not understand, but certainly empathise on some level the situation. Well, yes. Now, you can say in Ireland that went on for 800 years mm. and was resolved in 21, I think. Mm. So uh, we still have hope. Yeah. But... I should say that if you looked at what's happen- what was happening in Belfast, you could at some point have felt the same way as I described. You know, people don't want to be fighting their relatives, but they don't, they don't see a way out of the fear. And it actually took external powers, the yeah. European Union and the British government and the United States to bring forth the Good Friday Accord. Well, how does that work? Uh, and I know we're, we're, we're going over now, but, but right. I guess I was going to ask you one more question, but it might might end up being a long answer. <laughs> America seems to have an affinity with Israel, especially in the political, geopolitical sense. If you're a Republican, if you don't show love for America, uh, sorry, for Israel, then there's no way you can be a Republican, basically. Um, I've always been interested and a little bit confused with the closeness of that relationship. Um, but if, the, if that's one of the external uh, governments being involved in helping this area, it seems that they are so pro-Israel, and I don't use that term negatively, just as a perhaps literal observation, how will they ever help Israel? Because obviously in a, in a negotiation there's give and take. It seems from what comes out of America, there'd be no give to Palestine at all. So how using external um, help or forces if they're involved with that actually help the situation? Well, I should say that one could hope that the current American administration is not forever. Yeah. And the this is, well that's been going on for a very long time in America though. If it's if it's a Republican party it seems to be you know be all and end all Israel above all else in that region. Well, I I don't want to comment on American politics, but sure. I should say that certainly uh well part of the situation part of the situation seems to be that Americans and people in other democratic countries uh, and in the West uh, have a great suspicion and fear of Islamic jihadic forces. Mm-hmm. So insofar as the Palestinians are seen as part and parcel of those forces, it's hard to expect uh, Western countries or the United States in particular to be neutral about that. Yeah. So the challenge for the Palestinians is to disentangle or disengage themselves from the jihadist Islamic stance. And actually, I don't think that most, I'm pretty sure that most of the Palestinians in the West Bank do not identify with the jihadist Islamic positions. Most of them, though Mm. there is a minority who do. Yeah. So the challenge for their leadership and for them as a society is to clearly distinguish themselves from those forces, and in the hope that the West will realize that and not confound its battle against jihadic, militarist, Islamic, terrorist Islamic movements with the stance they should take towards the Palestinian people. And in terms of Israel and the Palestinians, the the optimistic side in me says we'll find a way of working this out. Do you think peace is possible? Do you think peace is possible? Oh, it's certainly possible. We need just Likely? Well, in the long run, I'd say it's likely. Mm. And as a religious person, uh, uh, believing in the vision of Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, the plowshare, swords into plowshares, uh, I would hope that that happens. But the likelihood of that that depends upon us. We have elections in Israel soon. Maybe Mm. there will be a change for the better in that regard. Mm -hmm. And... uh, we, I think, also need help from outside to uh, 
to force both sides beyond their fears.